This is your chapter six therapeutic communication lecture. These are your key terms. These key terms are what your chapter suggestions you need. This is not the list for your unit one test. These are the learning objectors as set out by the um, publisher. These are your nursing concepts for this chapter. So communication. Communication is obviously an exchange of words. It happens via verbal and nonverbal. Verbal is going to be those literal words spoken. Nonverbal is going to be the actions that we do that can impact how our message is received. So what is therapeutic communication? As we said in um, the last chapter, establishing a therapeutic relationship is one of the most important responsibilities of a nurse. Um, therapeutic communication is an interpersonal interaction between the nurse and the client during which the nurse focuses on the client's specific needs to promote an effective exchange of information. Skills used during the therapeutic communication techniques helps the nurse understand and empathize with the client's experiences. All nurses need therapeutic communication skills to effectively apply the nursing process and meet the standards of their client's needs. Your goals of your therapeutic communication are going to be to establish that therapeutic nurse-to-client relationships. Um, it's going to be to identify the important concerns that your client has. Um, we need to make sure that we're focusing on what the client wants, not what we think the client needs. We're going to assess the client's perception of what the problems are and how they unfold. It's going to help to facilitate the client's expressions of their emotions. We might be able to teach them, recognize their needs, implement interventions, and guide them towards identifying a plan of action that's going to satisfy their needs as well as be socially acceptable. When we talk about privacy, um, to, to do our therapeutic communication, we should be in a more private area um, so that the client feels comfortable disclosing information. However, we want to make sure that we're maintaining professional boundaries. So if we have a patient who's making sexual comments or they can't maintain boundaries, having it in the client's room is not going to be the best setting. We might need to have something more formal, like a day room. But rather than being in the center of the day room, we might want to be off to the side so that we're a little bit more secluded. At Peninsula, students are not allowed to be in the patient's room at all. Um, so just be mindful if you're going to be having um, your clinicals at that site. Um, you're going to have to conduct your therapeutic communication in a day room or in a hallway. When we talk about um, proximities, this study was conducted that um, kind of distinguished between different zones via a measurement of space. Um, obviously, if you're intimate with somebody, the inches that you're away from them are going to be zero to 18 inches. Um, when we talk about therapeutic communication, most patients or clients are going to be comfortable with three to six feet apart um, when you're conducting your study or your therapeutic communication. When we talk about social and physical distancing, um, we know that, you know, COVID-19 kind of changed all the rules of this stuff. Uh, we we're now promoting social distancing, which is having people stay away from other people started working from home, avoiding crowded areas and so on. This has impacted how people live their lives and they've changed um, a lot of concepts that this chapter is going to go over um, specifically with our touch um, touch. There's five different types of touch. Um, you know, when we talk about our professional, it's going to be functional touch, 
This is what we use when we examine our patients and during procedures. Um, it's also reaching out and touching somebody's hand for or touching a shoulder. Um, we need to remember that as much as touch can be therapeutic, it's also going to be an invasion of your client's personal space. And some clients might not want you to touch them. So you need to be mindful of that. You need to determine what they're comfortable with. And you need to respect that as much as possible. So true or false, a distance of two feet between the nurse and the patient is most appropriate for promoting comfortable therapeutic communication. And the response to this is false. We want three to six feet is more appropriate. Active listening and observation. Active listening and observation is receiving and sending simultaneous messages. The nurse must use active listening and active observation observation. Active listening means reframing from other um, internal mental activities and concentrating exclusively on what the client is saying. In today's day and age, it's kind of hard for us to do that. Um, as we're sitting there talking to people, a lot of times we start going through our to-do list, what we the tasks that we need to complete for the day. So you need to make sure that when you're doing your therapeutic communication, especially in your clinical rotations, actively listen to them um, and actively observe them, which means that you're watching the speaker as they talk. Um, you're not looking down at your watch. You're not staring off at the TV. You're not doodling on a pad. All of these, um, this active listening and active communication is going to help you with recognizing what's most important to your patient, knowing what questions to ask, using your therapeutic communication techniques, prevent you from jumping to conclusions, and being able to objectively respond to the message that your patient is trying to get across. When we talk about our verbal communication skills, um, we need to communicate in clear messages. The, the techniques we're going to use are going to be in the next few slides, as well as the techniques that we should avoid. Um, when we're interpreting our cues from our clients, we need to be aware of their overt, which are going to be clear, direct statements versus their covert statements, which are going to be indirect statements. So an example of that would be somebody says they're sad, right? That's very clear. That's very over. There's no, how do I need to read into this? What are they actually trying to say to me? Whereas a covert statement, you know, you might ask them how they're doing today and they say, yeah. Okay. So what does yeah mean? right? It's kind of vague. It's kind of indirect. It's kind of covert. You're going to need to use some therapeutic techniques to explore and focus and truly get out of them what they're trying to say. So therapeutic techniques, again, these are going to be um, in page 102 in your book. Um, they're really important to know. Um, when you start taking your questions on your tests, on your NCLEX, a lot of times you're going to have, you know, the nurse says blah, blah, blah. And the rationale behind why the answer is correct is because one of them is going to be like the best therapeutic technique that um, supports that answer. So to go over them, broad openings. Broad openings are going to be the best one. Broad openings are going to allow the client to kind of take the conversation and go where they need to go. Um, confrontation is good, but we can also um, use confrontation negatively. So confrontation is going to be to encourage comparison, to promote honesty, for a client to see maybe their own consistencies, or to give them the opportunity to explain things that are a little vague. Confrontation is not to be used aggressively to get the patient to pay attention or to develop a power struggle. So um, confrontation can fall under therapeutic and non-therapeutic. 
Giving recognition allows for um, acknowledging what the patient's done, helping to indicate awareness, reflecting kind of directs the client's actions, thoughts, and feelings back onto the client. Offering self is making oneself aware and available. Um, summarizing is a good way to, when you're starting to close out. Um, it helps to kind of organize, sun things up, gone over things that you've gone over before. So if this is like your third encounter with the patient, you might want to summarize at the start when we're closing out for the day. Summarization can help then too. Voicing doubt is okay. Um, it can be therapeutic, non-therapeutic techniques. Now, non-therapeutic techniques are things that you do not want to do with the patients. The biggest thing that I try to tell my students is do not advise people. Um, very often, the patient who's mentally ill, their perception of what's going on in their life might not be a good global view of everything. And when people offer advice to these clients and tell them what to do, um, you could give them advice that might, you know, be very detrimental to them. Um, it's better to listen to them and try to get them to provide what they think they should do and they can go through it. Um, I always think about you know, my brother on this advice thing. Um, and I remember he, when he was in the height of his psychotic issues, he was running around telling everybody that his wife had been cheating on him, which she had not. Um, but some people's advice to him was, well, if your wife's cheating on you, you should leave her. And unbeknownst to them, they didn't realize that his delusion was that she was cheating on him. He had this fixed belief that this was what was going on, even though it wasn't. So if you're advising somebody who's delusional, you could be giving them very detrimental information. Um, another thing that I noticed that students do a lot of time is they introduce unrelated topics. Um, the client might be going down a road that somebody feels a little uncomfortable with, so they bluntly change the topic. That's not good. Um, you need to figure out how to get comfortable or, um, you know, if you have to say to the patient, I'm sorry, I need to step away or whatnot, that's okay as a student nurse. Um, but, you know, you just don't want to stop them from where they're going. Um, and then reassuring is another thing that we don't like to do. You know, um, I know that when we're talking about medical patients, we want to keep their spirits up um, and we want to maintain hope. Um, for these guys, we really do not want to offer false reassurance because, again, that goes back to that congruent and non-congruent behaviors. So if you say everything's going to be all right, I'm sure you're going to get out of here in 24 hours, and then 24 hours comes and goes, well, you lied. So you just just need to be mindful of that. So our nonverbal communication um, is going to be our facial expressions, our body language, our verbal cues, the amount of eye contact we use, and even using silence can be part of our non um, nonverbal communication. Um, we want to make sure that we're sitting upright. Um, that we have an open posture. You don't want to be slouched back in the chair with your um, arms crossed, right? Verbal cues. Um, this could be the volume, the tone, the pitch, the intensity, the emphasis, the speed, all of that on your voice. Eye contact. Certain cultures, eye contact is good. Other cultures, eye contact can be considered aggressive, so you need to be mindful that you're not just staring at the person, making them feel uncomfortable. Question, true or false? Nonverbal communication is often less accurate than verbal communication. The answer, this is false. Nonverbal communication is often more accurate than the said word, um, especially if the two of them are incongruent. People can readily change what they're saying, but they're less likely to control their nonverbal communication. So if somebody says to you, I'm fine, but they're crying, 
these are non-congruent and most likely the tears crying is how they're truly feeling less likely than you know the words of thought Communication, meaning, and context of communication. Messages often contain more meaning than just the spoken word. As nurses, we need to understand all the meaning behind your client's conversation. Um, your text offers the example of um, a client with depression might say, I'm so tired that I just can't go on. Uh, the nurse needs to consider that the literal meaning of this might be that the patient is suicidal and therefore she needs to ascertain if they are. Um, to understand the context, you will need to implement your therapeutic communication techniques to validate um, by focusing and understanding and determining the who, what, where, why, when, how, and all of that. Understanding the spirituality of communication. Spirituality, we have to remember difference from religion. Religion is going to be an organized system of beliefs, whereas spirituality is the client's independent beliefs. It can be their beliefs about life, health, death, and so on. As a nurse, we need to understand our own so that we can remain objective and non-judgmental so that we can truly assess our client's needs and maintain respect and awareness of the client's beliefs. Leading into cultural considerations, um, all the same stuff, right? Culture is your socially learned behaviors, values, beliefs, customs transmitted down through generations. Because of differences, cultural assessment is necessary when we're establishing our therapeutic relationship. The nurse needs to be, um, the nurse must assess the client's emotional expressions, beliefs, values, and behaviors um, so that they can um, truly, you know, connect with their client. If the client doesn't speak English, this assessment needs to occur with an interpreter and understanding the differences in cultural communication can prevent unneeded barriers from being created. Um, you know, cert certain cultures, you know, you're not supposed to talk directly to certain family members. Um, you know, you're supposed to talk to maybe the hierarchy of the family. And by not following that cultural practice, you can place an unneeded barrier between you and caring for that client adequately. So truly understanding their cultural considerations will help you build and have a better therapeutic communication. So which of the following is a non-therapeutic communication technique? Reassuring, reflecting, focusing, or exploring. And the question for the answer is reassuring, right? Because of reassuring, if we reassure somebody and then our assurance turns out to be a lie, we're going to um, negatively impact our therapeutic relationship. So our therapeutic communication session goals, right? What what do we what do we hope to have after we have this communication, right? Well, hopefully we established a good rapport with our patient. We were empathetic. We kind of explored the client's thoughts and feelings and gave them a better understanding of what was going on with themselves, as well as us understanding what was going on with them. Hopefully we were able to guide them to some type of problem solving or coping mechanism. Um, and we were able to do a good evaluation of them. So when we're performing a therapeutic session, we want to start with an introduction, you know, hello, my name is whatever it is, establish that contract. So I'm the student nurse, I just want to talk with you, um, learn how the client prefers to be addressed. And, you know, sometimes we as humans have a tendency to call people sweetie or honey or dear ma'am, sir. And to some patients or clients, this might be enduring. To other patients or clients, this might be the most disrespectful thing that you could ever do is to call them hun. And therefore, you know, you've instantly shut that door on developing any type of rapport with them. So, you know, 
what would you like me to call you? And as long as it's appropriate, you know, if they want to be called John, call him John. If they want Mr. Smith, call him Mr. Smith. If their name's Honey, call them Honey, right? Um, and then the identification of the major concern. So what's on the client's mind? What do they want to talk about? We can find this out with non-directive roles, such as broad openings, big open-ended questions, things that give them the ability to divulge as much information that they want to. Sometimes we have to do the directive role, which is going to be yes or no questions, right? So going back to that patient that just doesn't want to go on anymore, you know, that was your broad opening that they, that they gave you that information. You might then have to take a directive role. Like, are you, are you considering killing yourself? Yes or no. So during the therapeutic communication session, um, again, we want to use those open-ended questions more often than the yes or no. Your yes or no's are going to be when you need to ascertain um, very specific information such as suicidal, homicidal, and things like that. We want to make sure that we're using things like think versus things like feel. We want to use active listening, again, with the open-ended questions. We want to build on our client's response. We want to use techniques that maybe clarify or help to place events in a sequence. If we're unsure, you want to make sure that you're asking for clarification, not just assuming that you understand what they're saying. You want to help guide the client to solving their own problems. You do not want to give them your experience advice and try to solve their own problems, um, as we discussed before. Now, with assertive communication, assertive communication is the ability to express positive and negative ideas and feelings in an open, honest, and direct way. Assertive communication takes practice. It can be helpful if you rehearse it. Um, the broken record technique is when we have what we practice, what we know we want to respond with, and we continue to respond with that no matter what the person is coming at us with. So a good example of this is if your boss is going to ask you to work overtime, right? You know that the weekend's open, you know that they're going to come up to you and ask you to work overtime, and you know that you're going to say, no, thank you, I do not want to work overtime, and that's it. And then your boss says, but why? Right? They're wanting you to give more information, the assertive communication is just going to say, no, I said no, thank you. I do not want to work overtime. And that's it. And that's what you leave it as. Um, people that are more um, passive aggressive might add other elements in, right? They might be like, well, I don't want to work overtime because I really just want time to myself. Um, if they're passive, they might just say, okay, fine, I'll work. If they're aggressive, they might start yelling, like, I said that I didn't want to work, right? That assertive person is just going to continue to say, no, I'm not going to work. No, I'm not going to work. No, I'm not going to work. And that's that broken record technique. Um, rehearsing the response is good when you're having to be in assertive communication with maybe a mental health patient. It might be that they want to use the phone. And you have to firmly say, no. It's not phone time. No, it's not phone time. No, it's not phone time. You don't want to get aggressive with them. You don't want to start to screen with them. You don't want to be passive aggressive with them where you're going to try and manipulate them. You're not going to be passive and say, okay, fine, you can go ahead and use a phone. You want to remain assertive and say, no, it's not phone time. And again, rehearsing the response is good because that way when you're presented with that question, you can assertively say no. Community-based care. So we talked about community-based care um, in that first lecture. Um, community-based care um, is going to be care for people with physical and mental health problems. This role continues to expand as our patient populations continue to expand. 
Um, as the nurse, we can be a major caregiver and we can be a resource person for these clients and for their families. Um, we're very responsible for primary prevention as well as wellness and health maintenance promotion. Our therapeutic communication techniques and our skills are essential for successful management of our clients in our communities, as well as our ability to collaborate with other clients, their families, and their healthcare providers. And when you're dealing with your mentally ill health patients, your additional providers might be um, therapists, professional licensed counselors, additional case management, psychiatrists. Um, psychopharmacologists, like there's tons of different types of providers that you might run into. So true or false, assertive communication focuses on negative, um, identifying negative feelings, right? This is false. Assertive communication focuses on expression of both positive and negative feelings or ideas of open, honest, direct manner. Self-awareness issues. So nonverbal communication is very important. It's just as important as our verbal communication. We know that even if we're upset, we can usually change our words, but changing our face or our nonverbal is a little bit harder. Um, being mindful that when you're practicing your communication, if you're Mentally practicing it while your client is talking to you, then you're no longer actively listening to them. So, um, you know, if you're actively communicating, it's okay to have periods of silence. So that way, when you respond, you're responding to what they said, not to the words that you heard when you weren't, you know, practicing in your own head. We need to listen how... Um, the client communicates and then examine our own communication skills. Um, it's good to be aware of our own communication skills. We might want to ask our colleagues for feedbacks. Um, and we also might want to audit somebody else's communication. And then if we hear things that they're doing and we like, we might want to incorporate that into our communication um, you know, knowledge bank. And then these two slides are the key points of the chapters that you can find in your textbooks. And that is the end of this lecture.